we faced a different generation of racism than our parents did. Mm -hmm. Things were much more blatant, so it was easy to say, that's racist, you're racist, exactly. this is a racist institution. But we're facing things that you're like, okay, am I crazy, or it, do they just do this? And so it kind of, you internal, we internalize a lot. Yeah. Does anyone have, y'all I love it, that's a dedication. This is Tanzina Vega reporting for the New York Times. At the Lowell Lecture Hall in Cambridge, crowds gathered to see I2 and Harvard, a one-night performance put on by students who feel marginalized at the university. Does anyone actually have physical tickets in their hands? Like people think we're just gung ho. Like no, there were times we didn't we didn't want we to didn't do want this to because it made us really like uncomfortable and have to face things and have to right. face people that we were not like prepared to. The play was based on a student interview project and Tumblr page, also called I2 and Harvard. The project focuses on tiny offhand comments, the kind that can seem innocent, but can really sting under the surface. At the beginning of the year, introducing myself to people, um, sometimes people would take a step back and be like, wait, what are you? They're called microaggressions, you and younger generations are increasingly responding to them. <laughs> I came from Connecticut. Connecticut? The microaggressions that I encounter are simply people who don't realize um, my racial background and who really question it. So, are you, are you really Asian? Can I see a photo of your mother? Microaggression is an academic term that's been around for decades. But recently, it's taken root in social media campaigns as students across the country are questioning whether their generation is indeed colorblind. It's important to have the vocabulary to be able to, like, describe your lived experiences right. in order to feel like they're justified because people are always trying to dismiss them. Right. We have to show that like these little daily microaggressions are just like sort of the little bubbling up of greater racial tensions right. that are like underlying this whole post-racial, like if we have this post-racial surface, there's like all of these extreme racial tensions underneath the surface where people are like, oh, we have a black president, we're post-racial, right. but still like it's okay to shoot a child just for having like black skin. You don't know how to respond. Um, you don't want to make it a, a big deal, but it is. And you almost regret some of those moments. There might be a comment that I don't want to think too much into because I'll rather just ignore it and then move on. So, but that's why I really enjoy the play, to see those that aren't necessarily ignoring it, but trying to do something about it. Why do you ignore it? Why do you ignore it when someone's it's always things to, It's always easier to ignore. To be clear, there's a risk in calling out microaggressions. Some worry it can make a situation more uncomfortable. And critics say these student campaigns are an overreaction to unintended offenses. But for some, conversations like these are a good reminder to be more aware. As a social worker who's gone through many <laughs> lessons of racism and sexism, and where people think they're experts, but they're not, um, and don't recognize that it's a lifetime of learning and a lifetime of interactions where you continue to learn and grow, um, I felt like it was an enormous opportunity to be reminded once again of what's real. <laughs> 